Welcome to another episode of the Chrissy Mayer podcast. We are on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, and SoundCloud. And if you're listening to us right now on iTunes, please go and leave a five-star review. I don't care what you write. It could be good or bad. Just go ahead and leave a five-star review. I'll read you a couple examples um, of what you could write. This one is from Baba Booey. Um, let those puppies free. I know he's talking about my boobs. I know you guys want me to let him out. It's just, I don't know. It, it might happen, maybe a little bit at a time, more and more cleavage, but thank you so much for the review, Baba Booey. Uh, here's another great review from Zhao Nini, 1986. The first time I heard of you was doing a very funny Greta Thunberg impression, terrific podcast, great guests, interesting takes, keep cooking. Thank you so much, guys. See, that all you have to do is just write a nice review with five stars and I'll read it. Thank you guys, this was ideal. Um, I'm so excited about my sponsors, uh, Silk City Hot Sauce. You've heard me talk about it. They're hot, they're hot guys. If you're, if, you, if you're finding you're living a flavorless existence, please go to silkcityhotsauce.com, use the promo code CMP. You're gonna get 15% off your whole order. And these guys are gonna throw in a free bottle of cherry sriracha and some cool stickers. So please go to silkcityhotsauce.com, get some pep in your step some kick in your ick, you know what I mean? Get, get, get sassy, get flavorful, get some damn hot sauce, guys. Uh, SilkCityHotSauce.com, use the promo code CMP. And did you guys know that Adam and Eve says the best part of staying at home is playing at home? Go to AdamandEve.com and use the special code CMP at checkout so you can get almost any item online for 50% off. And when you use the discount code CMP, you'll get bonus gifts like six spicy movies, a three-piece bonus set, plus free delivery. Uh, Adam and Eve has thousands of gifts, toys, and movies to help us lock down some great sex. I don't know. I don't know about you, Bobby. I think I might, a butt plug might be in my future. Um, I don't know. I got to break out of this sexual rut I'm in. <laughs> well, you know, being a barbecue, barbecue person, I use hot sauce as a sexual oil. <laughs> <laughs> didn't want to go there but since we went there you know don't use too much don't use too much hot sauce you'll end up like bobby and dark and sensitive areas i'll be careful with the jalapenos <laughs> i love you <laughs> i'm so excited to have this guy on the podcast today he is literally a national hero um he did four tours in iraq uh he performs for wounded warriors he was a, st a staff sergeant correct me if any of this is wrong correct. he won a purple heart um he's also a stand-up comic i mentioned that too um put your hands together for bobby henline Woo! i'm so used to hosting trying, comedy trying shows to together, so thank you. <laughs> oh my god thank you that out. <laughs> i'm so used to hosting comedy shows that i host the podcast like it's a comedy show like i'm gonna expect a crowd of people to like right <laughs> bobby you have the best fucking sense of humor uh of anybody um i was listening to some of your uh stuff online like you have th the best sense of humor like you first of all i love that you you say that you're like a burn survivor you're not going around being like i'm a burn victim which is you know yeah what yeah there's stages of it you're of course you're a victim and you begin boom you're a victim this happened to you uh, then you become a survivor. And then beyond that, you survive. Now you got to thrive in life. You got to become a th thriver and enjoy life and keep living. Yeah. And just for anybody who has never uh, heard of Bobby, um, did, did, you went at 17 years old into, served on, in the Gulf War. And that was around like, that was like 89 to 92. Yeah. And then yeah, after before your time. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was alive. I was, uh, I was born in 83. So yeah. Um, I wasn't in uh, army, like I wasn't ready to, whatever. I'm a girl, I probably, I probably never would have. I probably never would have, <laughs> I'm not tough. I can do two push-ups. And then after 9-11 uh, was called again to serve and did three more tours, correct me if I'm wrong, in Iraq. And yes. was, and and then so, and then was this in your last tour that the, you had an accident with, you were in a Humvee, which is an army oh, army vehicle. It's very- yeah. um, The cool looking Jeep thing. Cool and tough looking. <laughs> and there was a an IED, which is not a form of birth control for you guys no. listening. It's a <laughs> bomb. It's like a remote detonated bomb. It was under- Well, it depends what's getting blown up. It could be True. birth control. <laughs> true, true. Luckily, it's just my hand. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> God. So then this horrible fucking bomb goes off <laughs> under your vehicle. There's four of you in the car or five of you in the car? There's five total. Yeah. There's five of you. You're the only one to survive. Yes. So if that's not fucking hard enough, you know, and, uh, and then you had to go through a, a bunch of surgeries and by a bunch... 30 we're at 48 48, 48. <laughs> do you do you get your 50th one free is that or do i'm you... hoping so I hope there's like a coin or an award at the end there i but... would hope that they would have a punch guard because with coffees it's like you usually get your 10th one free so at this point i feel like you know the bar owes you a couple um the free tummy tuck or something <laughs> <laughs> yeah so, um so this is crazy this is fucking crazy what you went through and the fact that you're you you you're like you sound like a well-adjusted you know what i mean like you're not somebody who seems to be like <laughs> you know, angry at the world well comedians are not well adjusted <laughs> they're typically very angry at the world um you know if they can make it funny great but a lot of them just like never look within and right. like you know never look at go to, go to therapy or look at their patterns or whatever so the fact that you uh, su survived through this horrible thing and now you're you perform for wounded warriors like you're doing amazing things with your life and uh and just correct me if i'm wrong so uh so while you were in recovery what gave you the idea to start doing stand-up i actually did it to prove wrong my <laughs> occupational therapist kept bugging me because i used the humor to deal with it all you know, it's a, it's a great healing mechanism to just kind of, oh my God, this happened. We've got to make light of this. The situation sucks. You're going through a lot of pain. And I would joke about myself, other wounded veterans, and my occupational therapist, like, oh my God, you got to try stand up comedy. Hmm. And she had this really high pitched, annoying voice. Like, <laughs> and she was like, always happy. Those people are always happy. It's like, you can't be happy all the time. You never came to work in a bad mood. She never showed it. Wow. So, oh my God, it was exciting. Like, oh my God, happy all the time. So she was very annoying. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god crazy mister you're so funny you should do stand-up comedy and you're like okay <laughs> and like uh no it's not gonna work it's funny here there's other veterans they have a dark sense of humor i don't think the rest of the world can laugh about what happened to me it's, it's not gonna work and she just kept bugging me and bugging me so i was like you know i'm gonna prove you wrong i was going to ucla to have a surgery and she said all right while you're out there you should try stand-up comedy because wow. so i was living in san antonio at the time and i sure a friend lived in la or her sister and she said, e emailed me and said, hey, go, why don't you go to the comedy store? They're having an open mic tonight. I said, all right. I had actually pinky promised uh, my patient therapist I'd do this. So I'm going to do it. Get out of the way. Be done with it. See, it doesn't work. So mm -hmm. I went out to the comedy store there in L.A. And I did my open mic, uh, which was, of course, nobody laughed. You know, you get those three minutes. <laughs> 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 the little light comes on and tells you got a minute left. And I was done. I had no more material. But luckily... In ninth grade, I wrote a rap about being constipated. So, so that came in handy. <laughs> the rap, right? So that's, you know, I was able to get it out then. I wasn't constipated anymore. <laughs> so you, yeah, you had three minutes. But that's amazing. That's how everybody's first, you know, couple of years of doing stand-up feel exactly that way. Um, so what made you want to keep going past, you know, the hard, shitty beginning parts of stand-up? <laughs> it's when I got off the stage, one of the other comedians that was waiting, you know, I figured out, Part of it, no one laughs. It's because it's just open mic. It's just mostly comedians waiting for their turn to go up, practice new material or whatever, work on old stuff. So they're not really paying attention. No, or they're analyzing the jokes, right? Nobody's they're analyzing the <laughs> I wouldn't say it that way. I would say it this way. <laughs> yeah. So one of them gave me a compliment. And so I thought, okay, maybe I could do it. And it was, for me, it was another release, another way of just letting it out. So I started doing open mics in San Antonio three times a week. And Eventually, someone says, hey, you want to host a show? <laughs> you wow. Know, it all goes, yeah. so I host the show, and then I end up getting a, a big break. I've been doing comedy only two years. I started doing it two years after I was injured. So four years to the day, at the exact day, April 7th, when I got hit, 07. Four years to that day was my first big break at Brad wow. Garrett's Comedy Club in Las Vegas. Wow. Yeah, because you started stand-up in 2009, right? Yeah. I think I started in 2011. Um, so wow, that was really, how did that feel? That first kind of like big show? That was just crazy. You know, I got, uh, Brad gave me 15 minutes. JJ Walker was on the show. Um, Michael, what's his name? I can't think his last name. It does the thing about his stub and his toe. It's hilarious. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll, we'll remember uh, it at some point. <laughs> yeah. I know, you know, Geechee guy, um, he was on the show. He's like the record for the most one-liners and 
And Geechee guy does uh, these jokes. He calls them grenades. And so <laughs> oh he'll God. tell the joke. He'll act like he's throwing a grenade in the audience. And boom, they laugh at the right time. So he just times it out right. And I guess the first night, he didn't want to do it. He told the manager of the club, I can't do my grenade jokes because Bobby's here. Oh, my God. Because <laughs> <laughs> I told him, no, go for it. That's hilarious. I love it. So he did it. And we had a fun, fun time. But it was, it was amazing. It was exciting. And you're in your hotel room in Vegas, just looking out the window. I'm um, going, oh my God, look at the strip. Like, I'm doing stand-up comedy in Vegas. This this is insane. This is crazy. Like, people are coming to hear me. Well, oh, Michael Laughlin. Did you see? Oh, okay. Okay. Well, there you go. You remembered it. <laughs> uh, but, you know, people come to see Michael. They come to see everybody else for the show. But I, I got a chance. And Bill Barr gave me that shot. And it was just amazing. He's had me back in the club a few times after wow. that. It's just, and, so it's just, it's been amazing. And to set the pace for other things that came out of it, like doing documentaries. You know, I got to meet, get feedback from Bob Saget, Lewis Black, wow. um, Zach Galifianakis. We did a, a documentary called Comedy Warriors back in 2012. And so that, again, helped, uh, giving me that advice, learning from these, these pros and, and hearing them, you know, Bob, Bob Saget said the best, uh, not the best, because you know, I'm the best, but, <laughs> but <laughs> no, Bob Saget, you know, he, he made a funny line I never, I never thought of, which, you know, I make fun of my skin grafts and when I look, I do so self-deprecating stuff. So Bob said, you should do a joke about saving face. Oh my God. <laughs> yes. Holy shit. <laughs> like, wow. Why did I not think of that? <laughs> your, your, your jokes are so great. Like, yeah. And this is a Showtime doc. People would kill for a Showtime credit. Like this right. Comedy it's... Warriors uh, documentary was on Showtime. And uh, yeah, that must have been really. And you did that just a couple. Uh, you said you did that just a couple years into yeah, just a couple your years doing stand up. Yeah. And I, and I saw like a couple earlier videos of you and like you really, I mean, like for, just in the last couple of years, like you look incredible. Like you look so much, you know, so much, they were able to do so much with the surgery. Oh, and yeah. Like, it's yeah. just, a, it's really amazing what they were able to do. Um, and like amazing. The, the goatee is sweet also. They, you know? It gives me a little chill, a little character. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You could like put your initials in it, whatever. Um, yeah. Or, you know, I was watching some of your bits before here, you know, thanks for dinner. Um, oh god <laughs> thanks yeah yeah that's like one of my old that's one of my old bits yeah that was uh the hardest part of the lockdown for me is like i would go and get like you know european wax every month like on the dot i was like i'm gonna go i gotta get it keeped up or else no one's gonna go down there and then for six months i've just been having to shave it myself you know and just sort of in the shower hacking back there and <laughs> got a machete all, out you know yeah we all have our struggles <laughs> you should try doing it one-handed <laughs> <laughs> and it's so funny because like yeah like it was this one video of yours like uh yeah you were like you guys like clap it up you're like yeah clap because i can't keep clapping because i can't um, rub it in rub it in God, that should and like I'm not gonna be, you know. Hopefully by the time you guys all watch Bobby's uh, stand up, I'm not gonna be ruining your punchlines. But a lot of them are really I've been extinguished for years. You're so funny. <laughs> um, so tell me, so so you've been involved ever since you know last couple of years. You've been really involved with performing for the troops. You co-founded Bravo Seven Four Eight, which is a military and combat speakers bureau. Um, yes. And also the charity organization Forging Forward. Could you tell me more about those organizations? Yeah. So uh, Bravo 748, it's a military speakers bureau uh, with law enforcement also. And so we want a platform to, we know a lot of veterans like myself, uh, my manager started helping me because she actually hired me to speak at her company. And she's like, what was it take to get you here? And I was like, you know, hotel, airfare, whatever your budget allows. It doesn't, it's not about money. I want to make a difference. She's like, that's not how you do business. I'm going to help you do business. <laughs> like, oh, good. I hate that part. I could use some help. Uh, mm -hmm. And a lot of veterans are the same way. We get overwhelmed. Paperwork, like, oh, it's stressful. So uh, she started helping me. So we started talking to other veterans. They were doing all this donation stuff. You know, these people are bringing in lots of money, these fundraisers, you know, over hundreds of thousands of dollars. And the veterans are doing this stuff for free. But like, you need yeah. to get paid for your art, whether you're singing a song, telling some jokes, sharing your story. You need to get paid for that. So that's why we started. Uh, Bravo 748 so that we can help wow. other veterans uh, with the business side of it. Okay, that's great. And and like there's there's so much to learn. Like unless you're like a business mind, you're just there's gonna right. be so many things that are not in your strong suit. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and the and forging forward is that kind of along the same lines? It's a little different. It's uh, it's the Bobby Hinline Foundation forging forward, 
I was always helping these other nonprofits do stuff. And I thought, you know, what, what I've learned over the years, how I could help get back with my own foundation is to teach others how to forge forward the same way I did. Um, you know, I got my bumps, I saw my bad days, but things I learned how to deal with the PTSD, how to deal with survivor's guilt. And a lot of it's outlets, just doing outlets. It's camaraderie coming together and having outlets to express ourselves. I'm able to express myself through the comedy. That's an outlet for me to get it out. Um, I also write poetry, uh, songwriting. So for me, those are the arts that I use to get out of me. I know others, they're better at, with their hands, no pun intended, <laughs> but you know, they can do welding, they can do forging. Um, they can do these other things to take their art, those demons inside that they're battling and express those feelings into this art form, possibly just to do that, just to release stress and everything, or to sell these things that they can make this, this art and, you know, through painting even. So that's what I want to do. I want to bring uh, small groups of veterans, Gold Star families, uh, first responders that are having trouble, bring them in eight to 10 people at a time, a group, small group, and spend a week with them and teach them one of these outlets, hang out, have that camaraderie. Let's talk, share stories, help each other out. And so that's what I want, I want to do with Forging Forward. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Do you think that um, enough attention is being given to um, veterans that are struggling with PTSD or right, like first responders, you know, everybody? Yeah, I think I think there's definitely uh, enough attention. There's a lot of attention out there. Of course, every little bit we get helps because there's always that one person that may not hear about something that, you know, this group reached this many people, but even if this is a smaller group and they only reach one person a year, that's the point of life they say. And the problem is getting us to ask for help. <laughs> it's right. one of the biggest problems it's hard for anybody to ask for help but i feel like men in particular like really struggle i mean like uh, you know yeah boyfriend. or someone survives a war and they're like i survived a war i can i'll be all right i mentally got this yeah but they don't think about the underlying things they had before uh one of my issues i didn't realize i had <laughs> i was ocd um so you put the OCD that causes anxiety and stuff like that. Now you had PTSD with the OCD. You got two. You have all the letters. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I've almost got the alphabet written out, you know? Yeah. PMS in there and I'm done. Just be happy that you're not also LGBT, you know? I mean. <laughs> it's, it's confusing. I mean, but really, I'm only one more finger away. I mean, the pinky's already been there. One more finger. That's, that's, that's the uh, trigger finger. That's uh, You're done. <laughs> so you were it's OCD. Like the finger to, to join the club. <laughs> so you were OCD in the sense, like when I think of OCD, I think of like someone who likes things, I don't know, ordered, organized, maybe super clean. Is that, is yeah, that how I'm you not were? Yeah, super clean, but I need them where it makes sense to me. Whether it's the dishwasher. I mean, my ex-wife and I used to argue, I have the dishwasher, needs to be loaded. I said, all right, well, you load it if you want to load it. If you want me to load it, stay away, let me load it. Mm -hmm. and, you know, just, we gotta, you got to work it out that way. Um, even in the military, like, you're going through this war and you're, you could be living in your truck for a week. You would take over a building and live in that for a while. So just give me my cot, my corner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Let me set it up my way. Leave me alone. And then wow. I can function. I yeah. can function. Everything else could change outside of that. As long as I have this little space that I can go to that I know it's, it's, it may look like a mess to somebody else, but to me, it makes sense of where things are located and how they're placed. Right. So then, so then now <laughs> after like, you know, the recovery and everything that happened, you, you had probably say to yourself, like, all right, do I have to let some of this go? Um, you know, maybe there's more things I need to focus yeah. on. Like, yeah. And it, well, the thing is, I didn't even realize it at first uh, with the OCD part. I'm just blaming everything on PTSD. You know, it's, I'm angry. Of course, my, my, my family did that. You know, it's just you know, being a woman. Every time you get angry, it was like, oh, you're PMSing. <laughs> being yeah. a veteran, you get mad, you get angry. It's, oh, you got PTSD. Mm -hmm. No, sometimes I just get mad because you're being an idiot. <laughs> yeah, and it's you okay know? to get mad. Yeah, it's... Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of, uh, even from the time you're little, like it, it feels like, oh, like men can't be mad. Or if you're mad, it's, to it's toxic masculinity. It's like, no, it's okay to like be angry, feel anger, express it. You know, it's like, it's better yes. than keeping it all down. You got to express, you got to let it out in a controlled environment. I know I definitely learned that with going through all this uh, so I could stop punching holes in the wall or denting refrigerators or breaking furniture. Because uh, once you lose it, you, you're trying to hold back so long. And as soon as that one thing puts you over the top, then it's boom, just explodes. And then next thing you know, there's like three holes in a wall, a broken couch, like, holy shit, why did I do that? You're mad at yourself for losing that control because you thought you had control. And then you just curled up on the floor in a ball crying because you don't have control. It's just a very frustrating cycle.
Yeah. And that, right. It, it is a cycle that repeats itself. And then there's holes in the wall. People come over and you have to explain them. No, these are fancy Swiss walls. I paid extra for these. No, I don't have a problem with my anger. <laughs> um, I think it's so amazing that like you were, you know, at 17 years old, so young in life, knew you felt called to serve your country, went in for a couple of years. What was the moment you realized like, oh, I need to go back? Uh, I always kind of wanted to go back to those years, the 10 years I was out. Uh, my, my wife at the time did not want me to go back in the military. She'd never been around the military at all. So I always had children. So I said, no, you all stay out, do this, do that. And, and there's me wanting to go back in again. And I'm 30 years old. And this was right before September 11th when I kind of started thinking about it and talking to a oh, recruiter. It was before, okay. Yeah, just right before, um, literally like a month before. <laughs> I'm wow. like talking to a recruiter going, hey, I'm thinking about going back in. And they're like, well, this takes a long time. The background checks, you know, since you've been out so long. I said, that's fine. I just want to see what my options are. <laughs> and then boom, you know, a couple of weeks later, 9-11 uh, happens. And of course, I'm sitting there on the couch in the morning. And my wife at the time was getting ready for work. And I saw that you're saying, oh, maybe a small plane hit the tower. And then as you're watching that, boom, you see the second plane hit. And then I just yelled out, terrorists, right? Then, like, I knew what happened. And I think most of us did. And she's like, oh, my God. So that means you don't still have to go in. You don't have to go in, right? You just talk to the recruiter. <laughs> and I said, no, uh -huh. this means I need to go in. You know, this is obviously a sign that I need to get back in. I'm 30 years old. I've been there before. I can help younger vet or military active duty that are going to be there. That, that They're going through the same thing I went through when I went through Desert Storm. They're going to be 17, 18, 19, 20 years old. And I have this experience already that I have in war and going through that at that age, maybe I could help them, plus I could help my country. Um, so I went back in, I was back in basic training October 31st, the next month. Wow, back doing pushups again. Um, yeah, of course, you know, also that sped up. The recruiter's like, it might take some time. And I was like, boom, hey, we got you in right away. <laughs> oh yeah, because I was wondering like, yeah, after 9-11, if they were just like, not that they were gonna say, we'll take anybody, but I'm sure it's like they had lists of people who were interested. Right, there's still and, age limits and, and depending on why you got out the first time and all that stuff, so. Is, are there age are, maximums? Like, can you There are age maximums. I don't even know what it is right now. I know, actually when I got, right before I got blown up, I talked my brother-in-law into joining at 38 years old. Oh, wow. So he was actually in training when I got hit. That's crazy. Did, but did even he, at 38, he had to have a waiver back then. He had to sign, had to sign a waiver. Did, um, like, what happened to you, like, discourage him at all or freak him out? Or did it make him? You know? No, uh, he, he went on to be in, 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 I was in the 82nd Airborne Division when I got injured in two tours with them. He ended up going to, to the division there at 82nd and working there. Um, he did a couple tours in Afghanistan. He got out, became a contractor, went back overseas a few more times. And he's still in the business as a civilian. He doesn't have to go overseas anymore, but wow. he does some stuff out at, at Fort Bragg. And so he's still working as a civilian now. Do you remember anything from, from the accident? Like I, I, I imagine that kind of a blast, like maybe you would be knocked out or, um, you know, do you remember Yeah, anything? that was the, the hard part. I couldn't, I couldn't remember anything. And so I thought maybe I was knocked out. It was three years before I really got to talk to everybody that was there. Actually, I was back in Iraq three years later. <laughs> you, were, you went back to Iraq after the accident? Yeah, three times. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, so out of the four times you served, the accident happened on your second time in? Well, we say accident. The guy did it on purpose. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. <laughs> I like your face. You're like, wait, I can't. It was no. like obviously <laughs> the shittiest thing you could do. Yeah. I'm just like, but the no, thing that I was happened. three times doing comedy. You know, I went back for my own healing. They call it Pro Operation Proper Exit. They, Troop First Foundation brings wounded veterans back to kind of leave the proper way, you know, proper exit. Oh, wow. So okay. I went back with a group of 10 of us the first time. I think that was 2011 when I went back and went back over there. All 10 of us are going around to different bases in Iraq sharing our stories to the, wow. the military personnel that's there. And of course, I'm already doing stand up at this point. So it's sharing my story. I did just did a five minute bit. <laughs> and yeah. of course, then I was like, hey, come to the chow hall tonight. And next thing you know, I'm traveling around doing comedy at chow halls in Iraq. <laughs> That's amazing. Do you find it's easier to perform for other veterans or civilians? Veterans. Uh, definitely, they're, I, don't, it's not, I don't have to break them in to laugh at it. <laughs> and I can take it a lot darker with them. Yeah. <laughs> 
Really, I I love how dark you are. Like dark comedy, it's so great. It's so refreshing. It's uh, I think it takes like real balls. Yeah, and I I think with most crowd most crowds too, it's like you have to spend a few minutes being like, no, it's okay to yeah. laugh. Like if I wasn't okay with laughing about this, I wouldn't be up here. Yeah, there was one time in Vegas, and we had a lady right there in the front row. You know, you could totally hear. Her. Of course, you know, you know, it's the only row you can actually see. If anything, mm -hmm. <laughs> and she's like, they're going, "Oh my God, I can't laugh at this." And she's turning to the stranger next to her, telling her, "I can't laugh at this." You know, and I'm hearing this, so of course I like, "Excuse me, man, really, I've been through all this, and I can hold your hand, let you know it's okay." Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it's like, "Oh my God, I'm sorry," and she kind of relaxed a little bit, but it, it's it's hard sometimes to get them, especially if you had a a conference to help wounded veterans, <laughs> and so then I have to share this story ahead of time. Uh, to let them know now they, be, they get to know me more and they can laugh with me at the end of it so yeah yeah no that's like it's incredible it's it's really you deserve like i mean it takes so much balls just to even like do stand up most people's greatest fear is public speaking and, right. and the fact that you're doing it and you're you're giving so many people hope people that you talk to people that you'll never talk to never meet like you're changing so many people's lives uh, yeah that's what i found out you know through the comedy it's another avenue besides speaking uh, it's another way to reach an audience that maybe weren't expected you know on friday night they had a long work week and they're like oh my god let's get some comedy let's see someone let's go hear someone's life that's worse than mine so i feel better <laughs> or, or, right? or they can relate to the comic and, and it, it makes them feel better and they're having drinks that makes you feel better <laughs> yeah drinks always always help so tell me so this is very so this is interesting what we what you came across uh yeah. on social media it was basically um i don't know how the, this rumor or this whatever you know message got out there that I, and I think that the the mainstream media, obviously, everybody knows at this point that they have a liberal bias. They're own, all of mainstream media is owned by like five companies in this country, and they're all like very liberal bias, very like democratic, very anti-Trump. You know, if you've been living in this country for even a year, you know this at this point. Yeah. So uh, and it goes both ways. They both do it. They know both sides. It's 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 sad yeah. telling half truths what they want to tell you, not that they're lying to you. What right. they want to tell you is part of the truth. Right. Yeah. So you came across something uh, on social media. It was basically your, it was your picture, your image or a video of you being used um, basically to, to forward this narrative that like Trump, uh, you know, that veterans were pissed at Trump for calling them a losers, which I don't believe for a second. Like, I feel like veterans are going to be more into Trump just based on everything <laughs> I know about like my friends right. in law enforcement or whatever. Um, but yeah, explain what, you know, where you first saw this image, how it made you feel. Yeah. This is crazy. This comes from something, I guess, <clears throat> two years ago at some parade planning. And they said during the planning, Trump said we shouldn't have wounded veterans out here. Uh, they're, they're a disgrace or they're, people don't like it or something. The verbiage has changed so much when you go back looking, trying to find out whether it happened or not. And the sources are unknown and, and then they'd been debunked. And it's, it's just crazy. The back and forth that when I looked this up, I mean, even General Kelly, who was there in General Kelly and Trump don't really get along. And even he said that if that was said, there's no way he would have let that been said. So he didn't hear it. Um, so it, it's just that he said, she said stuff that happens all the time is what I looked into. Cause you know, it, it actually came out. The funny thing is on, I think it was September 4th or 5th, I, I saw it and I didn't actually see it. Somebody shared, posted me, hey, did you see this? Someone sent me a text. Then someone sent me a message on Facebook. So I had multiple people sending me this going, hey, did you see what they're doing with your photo? And I was like, oh my God. So I've had this happen before where someone's trying to sell t-shirts for about veterans. Oh, like this guy. And they click on a link and they're just selling a t-shirt using my wow. face. So I've had to have them take that down and stuff. But this was really different. This was even bigger. Uh, so I'm like, that, that's ridiculous. You need to take this down. So I would look it out. The funny thing is, the news thing came out on September 3rd is when it hit and uh, they started making these memes. That was my birthday. <laughs> oh my God. So like, yeah, not the way you'd want to spend your birthday. Like, I just turned 49. I thought I was done fighting. Okay. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So I That's see crazy. this, it was like this tweet. Um, I think occupied Democrats might've been one of the handles. Yeah. They were one um, of the first ones I saw it on. And it's you talking about like, Hey, this is me. I'm the guy. This is my photo. Um, these idiots use my photo without my permission. They took advantage of a wounded veteran. That's what they did. They're out there posting this stuff all over Facebook using my image. Like I agree with them. I'm done. Yep. Take it down. Um, so I think this Occupy Democrats uh, handle on Twitter, I think they yeah. 
ended they ended up up, they took taking it down. it down. They took it down, so I took down my rant. That's all I wanted. I don't want nothing more. Just take it down. I'll take down my video rant at you. Just go away. Yeah. <laughs> I want to go back to being funny. I don't want to be in this politics mess. I want to go just go be the funny, goofy guy. Um, yeah, yeah, so you're not like up out for revenge. You're just like, no, yeah, no. enough. Yeah. And then it, it popped up again on another one. Um, and the same photo had me and two other veterans in it. And so I was like, no, take it down. They're the same rant. 24 hours later, he's taken down. Like, I'm done with this. Okay. <laughs> We're done. We got it off. Thanks, everybody, for helping me put the word out there. Uh, and then I wake up the third day. <laughs> it's a new photo. It's just me. And it's saying that Trump called me a loser. They think I'm a hero. What do you think? I'm like, no, you still, just because you you think I'm a hero, thinks it's okay that you get to use my photo for your agenda. No, you don't. You didn't ask me, you didn't give approval. Even if Trump did say, if Trump came out and there was a video and he goes, yep, yeah, I said that. <laughs> still, you don't use my photo without asking and put my yeah. face on it. So you, uh, that irritated more. That was a, a veterans group. Do you yeah. feel um, like there that he did say this? Do you Do you feel like there's a chance he said he really said this yeah Colin Fall and veterans losers I don't I don't know I don't know if I buy that do you think there's a right. chance no, he said I, that I don't buy it uh, and as you see that people argue back and forth if you read through the thing that so-and-so said this Atlantic News said that and that's what it is it says he said she said so there's no actual facts so let it go you and can't this is, prove it <laughs> yeah and this you is can prove some... it okay push it but there's no proof so let it go it's, and putting someone's face to it is, makes it even worse because it looks like Trump yeah. just said Bobby Hinline, you're a loser. You know, it's that's crazy. Yeah, and, and I, I really don't. It's really disgusting what they're doing. Um, because it, to me, it reminds it's like there's so much identity politics going on, like more so with this election than any other. Uh, you know, you have yes. like you have Biden basically, and we see so much generalizations of like groups of people. That, you know, everyone's after uh, this group of people's vote. This group of people's vote. Joe Biden went on a radio show and says like, "You ain't black if you don't vote for me." Right. Um, <laughs> you know, it's I think it's kind of a dehumanizing thing to group people people together like this because it's like we're individuals like yeah we identify with right right like what we look like whatever you know families we came from you know but yeah. it's just because you're black just because you're a veteran just be, there's no like cookie cutter set of beliefs or ways of voting no. based on no. who you are exactly what, what you got blacks on both sides you got whites on both sides you got veterans on both it's all you got everybody, everybody on both sides there's not nothing except there's no there's no group or there's when it comes to a race or a, a job, an occupation, or anything. It, it's insane that people do this. And it's worse that they even hurt each other over it. I mean, if someone's wearing a MAGA hat and they get beat up, I mean, that's just ridiculous. Like, yeah. really, that's what you got to turn to? And then, then we're supposed to listen to you, like your opinion after you do shit like that? Yeah. It's, it's, I can't stand that. That's the worst way to handle it. Um, we all have this right. That flag represents our freedom and our right to make a change, to go up and change the laws to make things better. So why do you disrespect the flag? Why do you disrespect the people who fought for that? You have the right to change it. And if in your area, go, talk about it. Tell us about it. Because you know you're saying earlier, we're from different areas, and that's how we're going to lean left or right in the middle or make our choices because the way we were brought up from our environment. It, we're not from that environment. So tell me about your environment. I'll tell you about my environment. This person will share their environment. And as a group, we figure out what's best for this country to help everybody. Yeah, it's through conversations uh, and and like hearing people out, you know. And it's like you're someone who thinks differently than you is is not your enemy. And as someone who's yeah. survived like real war, real conflict, what do you think of when you see like, you know, um, shootings breaking out and riots and chaos in all these different cities across the country? Yeah, it's it's crazy. It upsets me. I mean, I stopped watching the news. It just yeah. infuriated. I can't believe that you know, stuff is happening. And then of course that's all it's focusing on. So it seems like <laughs> it seems like you walk out the door, you're in a war zone. Um, yeah. But it's really not that bad. But of course that's all the media shows. But that, yeah, we do to stop that. It's just, it's just ridiculous. Uh, people need to understand. Part of the problem isn't just who the president is. It's the congressmen and women, the Senate. Those people got it. They've been in there thirty years. They got to go. Yeah. <laughs> Times change. Generations change. The world changes. We need new thoughts new processes, yeah. people that are willing to listen to the, the different generations that are coming up in the different neighborhoods that want to talk and share how we can all live together. You know, as I was saying earlier, let's stand up together and rebuild, not stand divided and destroy. It's, yeah. it's ridiculous.
It's, it is exciting to see a lot of these new, like younger people running for office. Um, exactly. And people are so quick to blame Trump. It's like, he's been there for four years. Like you, exactly what you said, like Pelosi, a lot of these Congress people, they've been there their entire lives yet. Like yeah. it's uh, everyone, everyone loves blaming Trump for everything, but it's like, yeah, it's right. like, look at, look and at because, Biden. And just like, because yeah. he doesn't know how to speak right. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll say that. You know, not everything he says is politically correct. And now yeah. he's, he's a businessman. But this is what the country needed. We need, I, I think, the best for the president and vice president slots in there. If you have a businessman or woman in one of them, and the other one be a veteran, you got someone who's experienced the world and, and war and stuff like that, then you got someone who understands the business. The country's going in debt. We need that business mind to help us. So yeah. we need those two things. A man or woman, doesn't matter what color you are, <laughs> please come in and help us. <laughs> how, how do you feel about, um, or how, like you and your fellow veterans, like how do you feel um, like treatment and services have been, you know, since Trump's been president? Have you noticed much of a difference or? Yeah, I, my, myself personally, I've not been treated any different, any better, or any worse. It's, mm. it, it seems fine. Uh, he is getting on the VA. I know there was the one law um, he changed where now, uh, a military person could sue medical oh, wow. personnel. And I couldn't. I had some surgeries done by a doctor who I told him not to do it a certain way. I even went above his head to say, hey, look, he's not listening to me. I don't want to do this surgery. So his boss talked to him. They said, no, he's not going to do it that way. He did it that way. Oh, man. <laughs> I Ugh. woke up. And the surgery was done the wrong way. It took another two weeks till the final process was done. I was in a lot of pain. I didn't need that. He was too busy not listening and wanting to correct every little detail. I said, I want to be functional, make me functional. I don't care how I look, I'll be fine. Um, I want to be able to live life. Uh, I want to be able to hang out with my children, you know, someday hold my grandchildren. That's what it's about. It's not about me trying to look perfect or anything. Yeah. And so, yeah, I would have loved it, took him out. But then again, he did save my life. He put skin on my head. Uh, <laughs> so he yeah. did some good things, but then he didn't do all the right things. So it's frustrating, but those are some of the laws that are changed that you know, they at least think about it because there are ones out there that don't know I can't get sued. So they're not worried about the risk. But most of them, I think, are worried about the risk anyways. They want to do the right thing. Yeah. And is your feeling from, you know, talk to, talking to like your, your buddies that are also veterans and just the ones that you meet, you know, out and performing, like is the are the feeling is the feeling out there that most of them are kind of like for Trump? Are they you know, how are they feeling? Yeah, for the most ones I know, they're, they're definitely for Trump. They're guns or they're Trump. They're ready to go protect, you know, everything they can in this country. We have to stand up and, and block people from ruining our own cities, you know. Those are most of the people that I know that are doing that type of stuff. I, yeah, sure. it must feel super frustrating to be like, wow, it's like it's like you you guys are like fabricating conflict. You know, you guys could just be like home, working on yourselves, hanging with your family. <laughs> but it's like, yeah, you're, you're like off from your job or whatever. Or you're like, uh, you know, you're out there kind of like creating, creating a war. You kind of don't have to. It's like you, it's right. like your effort would be best served, I think in other ways than, than burning down someone's business or like starting shit in the street and, you know, like. Yeah, it's, it's just total nonsense. Fights, and yeah. You know, and what do we do with law? You know, the law holds us back from stopping those people. You know, I'm one of those crazy veterans, like just shoot them. <laughs> Look, if you're out here past 10 o'clock looting and breaking windows, we're gonna shoot you. <laughs> yeah, it's like for how, how much longer, most people agree with you. Like how much longer are we gonna like let this go on? And... Happen. Yeah, it's, it's insane. But the freedoms that they have and they're not, exercising those rights that's taking advantage of them that's not exercising them what would be a better way for people to exercise their rights right now if they are feeling frustrated and they are feeling like going and protesting and getting caught up in all that shit yeah you got to start locally you got to start off with your congressmen and women in, in locally in the senate or your city your state your mayor build it on up try that way try helping your neighborhood alone if you, everybody did something for their neighbor <laughs> I mean, how easy and fast would that grow? It'd be, it'd be great. Uh, and that's why they just got to start doing that. Look how you do it, you know, through the paperwork trail. You know, like they say, the pen is mightier than the sword. If, if you really, that's what the laws are there. You can change it to make a difference. You really can. Yeah. <laughs> and then like you hear a lot of people, stop resisting arrest. <laughs> if you got three felons and a cop are coming after you, you're probably like, all right, you got me. You chose to play <laughs> yeah. the game, right? You, right. Chose to, you, you chose to play cops and robbers. You made that choice. Now you're caught just surrender but now you don't and it ends up these other problems that and of course idiots take it the wrong way 
Exactly. And like, and the narrative is, oh, like, oh, all these people are getting killed for no reason. It's like, oh, what? But why does it keep happening that like every person who gets killed ha- has like a, a rap sheet and is like ton- tons of shit that they've done. And it's like, it's, it's, right. it seems very rare like that someone is. That were, one or two yeah. that you can really question. I'm like, yeah, I get it. But there's most of them, it's not. It's not that case. It, it's insane. Yeah, and it's just like, yeah, like look at with any job, there's going to be a percentage of like shit that goes exactly. wrong. It's just that like the yeah. media takes it and magnifies <laughs> it and twists it to, for a certain goal. Um, so, so like, you know, I, I guess you were feeling like really upset, like because you you know you saw your you know your friends were telling you like, hey, your picture's up, it's being used. Were you just yeah. trying to get at them through social media? Were you sending emails? Were like, what channels were you going through? Yeah, I mean, that was pretty much it. I saw that on social media. I know that what they sent me. So I went on TikTok because I know how to put it as a green, uh, green screen. Otherwise, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Good for you for doing TikTok. Man, like, I, I feel like I aged out of that 10 years ago. But I yeah. just started in March, you know, the quarantine. I had nothing else to do. I was playing golf <laughs> and tic- TikToking. And it's funny, I tried doing the dances and I just look weird. And I can't do YMCA anymore. It's just awkward. I look illiterate. Uh, <laughs> so I just I, one day I told a joke I, I took a part-time job at Lowe's during the season that just fill some time in for me and I was making jokes about selling hand saws and stuff like that oh and, and then it just went boom it exploded it's like oh okay I just take some of your old material tell a joke on TikTok that's what people want to laugh that's your platform you, you make people laugh so uh, that's what I continue to do I try to find other ways to bring light into their day yeah you know? Good for you. Yeah, and you're doing it. And I feel like, you know, your your busy season is coming up, Halloween, you know, you're gonna be Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Problem is everybody's gonna be wearing a mask. And so it's <laughs> it's the one day I don't have to put on the mask. It's it's awesome. I look more and more, I blend right in. Um, that's great. Last, uh, last year I made forty bucks laying in my neighbor's yard. It was awesome. Really? <laughs> <laughs> Just laying in <laughs> that's a great that's a great part time job. Laying down on the job, literally. Do you, did you, I know I'm jumping around a lot here. Like, did yeah. you feel, cause you mentioned survivor's guilt. Did, did you experience that being the only one from, you know, your vehicle there to make it out alive? Yes. Uh, survival's guilt is one of the, the biggest thing. In the first year I had, I felt like a burden to my family. My kids had to help me tie my shoes, walk around. I couldn't see. I had medicine in my eyes, my wow. head was in the skull. So I had all this medicine and goggles on my eyes. So everything was really, really blurry. And probably for what eighteen months, before I finally got scanned to work on my head. Wow! So, I was so you around. couldn't see anything for yeah. eighteen months. Yes, it was like it was like driving with your in a bad rainstorm with no windshield wipers. Like it was that bad. My my left eyelid was totally gone. They had to rebuild it. But somehow they saved the eye. They were going to throw it away, but they were able to save both my eyes. I have twenty twenty five, twenty twenty. I hear just fine. It, wow. It's amazing. It pisses my kids off because they wear glasses. <laughs> you're blind without the contacts <laughs> you're like look even if i wore glasses like they're not going to stay up on the other side so right you gotta get the little strap and yeah i'm ready to play racquetball <laughs> you would make it you would find a way to make it look cool i mean i think but that's the, yeah, the survivor's guilt thing and, and burden I, I prayed to god every night for the first year to take me you know wow. i was the only one to survive like i shouldn't be here I signed up for war a second time. Those four young men died. Why am I here? I'm burdened. I'm useless. And I prayed every night that I wouldn't make up the next morning. And then as I started to get uh, my independence back and I could see again, I could drive again. Uh, so I started doing all that stuff. It's like, okay, I'm here for a reason. You know, and if the only reason I'm here is to see my children grow up and maybe be an example for them on how to get through something like this in life and keep going, then that's what I'm here for. And I want to be here for my children. And so I just started being positive and started joking more and it just evolved from that so that made me feel better in that sense with my family but the survivor's guilt uh, was hard I, I barely knew the, the other guys um, they had been over there for six months by the time i got with them i was only with them for like a week and a half to two weeks uh, so i wanted to know them more who they were and so i got to know their families uh, that helped and then just learning over the years and thinking about it and I share this with other veterans or anybody that may have survivor's guilt for any reason. Uh, think about the ones that didn't come home. If we switched and I didn't make it home, mm-hmm. what would I want for the survivor? Wow. 
Yeah. I wouldn't want their life to be wasted. I don't want them drinking the way of life, feeling pity that they're alive. I want them to experience life. I want them to live their life to the fullest. Live for me, live for my family, don't waste that. And so, and then I know that's what they want for us. And I've talked to their families, I know they want that. Um, uh, the Gold Star families, uh, if you don't know, people don't know that, the Gold Star family is a family member who had a family member die over the war. And so you have these wives and husbands and brothers, sisters, mother, fathers, they want to talk about their family member. A lot of us <laughs> wounded guys are just veterans that have been over there, but they were physically wounded, you know, that's in, mentally wounds. Uh, no one comes back the same, so we all have some kind of issues, of mm -hmm. course. But the Gold Star families want to talk. They want you to ask. If you ever meet a Gold Star family, tell me about your son. Tell me about your husband, they, brother or sister. They want to talk about it. They don't want you to treat them weird and be awkward in the room. They want to talk and be part of the, the veteran family. Wow. Which seems like the opposite. Like I've no, nobody, I mean, my dad, I don't know. He was in some, some war. I don't know. Maybe it was golf briefly, but like, I don't know. I feel like he wasn't in any, any like actual, I don't know. Maybe he was in an <laughs> office somewhere. Like he doesn't have any cool stories. Um, that, looking for the Salvation Army. Like, yeah, you know what? Maybe he just donated a lot of clothes, you know? <laughs> Maybe he just, that was the Salvation Army. Because um, the feeling is like if, yeah, if someone like dies at, you know, at war, it's like, don't talk about it. Don't ask them about it. It's a sore subject. It's going to be like a trigger. Yeah. It's like pretend it didn't happen when, and you're saying it's the opposite. Like these families, they want to talk yeah. about their husband, their son. Their, they want to tell you, know, you how wonderful you are, what this person did, what it meant to them. Um, for sure. Uh, other veterans may have a hard time talking about their friends they lost. That, that could still be an issue um, for sure. But the Gold Star families, most of them I talk to, that's what they want. Yeah. And especially like if you, right, if you were like buddies, like if you were really tight with any of those guys, it would be even yeah. harder. I stay in touch with all the families. Um, you know, I lost four personally with me on that, on that uh, bomb, but my unit that year lost 22 total. Wow. And it was just, it was 07 during the big surge. So um, that's pretty much why it happened. We're just north of Baghdad. But those, the, the four guys in my Humvee, their, their families, they, they, they're always commenting on my social media. We keep mm. in touch, we call each other here and there, just sending messages. And of course, April and April 7th comes around every year. <laughs> Your body goes through this transition, you know what's coming up. And, and so we always kind of touch base and check on each other. It's, it's really oh, nice. you said like every around April 7th, you feel? Yeah like the yearly yeah, okay. your body knows like i go into this thing like and it's funny because april 7th i know that date right so i know that it's coming up and and sometimes it happens earlier this one year it was happening in march and i was like with those same feelings that i get were happening in march and i don't know why I'm like this doesn't make any sense today why am mm -hmm. i feeling like i know this feeling i'm getting it to come over my body like my body is feeling fear it's it's, it's feeling injury it's, it's just oh my god it's just this weird feeling and i can't think i feel like i'm in a fog I think I'm in a fog. Did I just say it right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You feel, feel foggy. Fog. You feel weird. Uh, You're like, yeah. But it's just, it was taking my body. I was like, what is going on? I said, you know, I'm going to try to at least answer some emails today, see what's going on. I got to do something. I was just sitting there doing nothing. And I click on the computer and it pops up 10 year anniversary of the Iraq war. And oh, I'm like, wow, gosh. how did my body know that? I was there, you know, March 10th. I was, boom, I invaded from the beginning. Uh, so it was weird that my body knew that. <laughs> even though I couldn't remember yeah. My mom. yeah it's like your body remembers like grief. not like it's any but like yeah my mom died August 2nd like two years ago but it's weird like yeah. I start it's always like the beginning of August is for sure like even the weeks leading up to it because it's like our birthday yeah. was late July and it's it's weird like you're just like I'm in a I'm in a bad mood I'm down I don't really know why and then you're like oh yeah obviously yeah it's and interesting you the like yeah you're like oh <laughs> it's interesting the ways in which like your body like remembers you know grief and trauma um, when you were in the hospital you know getting all these surgeries talking to the doctors especially that one year well year year and change you went like you couldn't even see what were what were you getting from the doctors and the nurses like what were they were they were they giving you hope about how things were going to end up yeah they definitely gave hope i know uh, just hearing the stories when i was the first month i was in a coma for two weeks a medically induced coma uh, the doctors wanted me to wake up like they after two weeks i think they woke me up and, and they put you in a coma I, just to work on just to work on you basically. yeah in iraq yeah. they put me in a coma I, got, I have a picture of me getting my purple heart in iraq still wow. <laughs> like they get a ceremony and pin it on me at the hospital in iraq uh, just in case 
Do you remember that ceremony? No, wow. I'm out. I was already in the coma. Uh, I don't, the blast, when the blast happened, I don't, I don't remember the whole day. And it happened wow. five o'clock in the evening. I remember next day, I remember I woke up in Texas two weeks later. Holy shit. I mean, it's like that obviously happens for the best. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, I mean, but they got me back from Iraq to the States in 72 hours. Like if they weren't able to do that with today's technology, you know, these people, the Air Force and everything that they got me to Germany, back to San Antonio in 72 hours. It, it was amazing. That's and I, you know, I wouldn't have lived. You know, even when I got there, they said medically, I should not be alive. Like they wanted me to wake up and I wouldn't wake up. Even though they stopped giving me the meds, they wanted me to wake up to find out. They didn't know. It, it, could I see? Could I hear? my brain even functioning they weren't sure wow. and so i finally woke up so i had a lot of trouble that's been a month in icu six months total inpatient uh, but they were always they were always very positive you know the doctors and nurses and stuff like that and even early on they'll, they'll tell me some stuff uh, i have to apologize to all the nurses that took care of me in icu because <laughs> they told me stories how i put them in headlocks i kept trying to escape Really? Like, yeah. Seriously? I was breaking metal splints. Like if I would have jumped out of bed, I was I'm not like I'm gonna go anywhere, but I didn't know any different. So you but you really I'm, tried to break out of the, of the out. hospital a couple of times? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Well they have you on ketamine and in your head, you're hallucinating, you know, the special K <laughs> tranquilizer stuff. But they have to give that to you in that in that state and everything. So I was hallucinating. I, and I remember some of my hallucinations as I was slowly come when they finally stopped giving it to me, the last couple of hallucinations I could kind of think back and remember going through these weird things and then finding out where I was, where I was located when I could actually see stuff. It made sense to me when I look back at my hallucinations, what was really happening. It was crazy. Wow. And they gave you <laughs> special K as what, as a way to like deal with pain or to deal. Yeah. 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 To deal with pain. My, my wife at the time had yelled at them to take me off of it. They said, he's crazy. He's not eating. He's, he's having all these problems. He's trying to escape. They have to call her in the middle of the night, trying to calm me down. Sometimes that would make it worse, I guess. Um, so eventually she said, you got to take him off it. They're like, he can't handle it. He has to have that. She's like, you don't know if you don't take him off of it. So she talked him into taking me off of it. And then, then I remember coming out of it and sharing an experience with my sister one time. And I can't see my sister, <laughs> but I'm telling her, I'm sitting on a rooftop, like in New York City, like I'm sitting on top of a building looking down an alley. There's some bums by the fire pits and the trash cans. And then the alley splits open into like a beach scene. So it was like wow. this weird scene in my head. And I'm just sitting on top of the building, kicking my legs off the edge, looking down at it all. And my sister's like, okay, we were in a hospital bed. <laughs> you got a window to your left. I'm You're not right. Batman. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I couldn't even see her. None of these things. Like, I just saw this hallucination. Wow. It's crazy. So were the, were the people in the hospital, were they saying like, okay, you'll get your vision back. You'll, you know. Okay. Yeah. Cause my, they, they knew my vision wasn't gone. It was the medicine. Um, you know, and they kept trying to save the eye. I've had like 16 surgeries just on my eyelids. Wow. And so they knew I could see still. They didn't know how well I'd be able to see, but they knew I'd be able to see um, at that point. But it was just trying to get those eyelids to work and get them to protect the eyes. So since I couldn't close them all the way, like I still don't know if you see it, <laughs> I can't close the left eye at all. Does that, so. The right direction. <laughs> right, so you can't, okay, so that's interesting. You can't close it. So do you have to like do a lot of drops and like try to keep it? Yeah, Moist if you can't, give me, yeah. Like, wipe me my eye, call it my Linus, you know. Oh, oh you're blanky. Yeah. That I have to have with me all the time. <laughs> but yeah, it, it drops, but they keep having surgeries to kind of correct it and keep it level so it, does, it drains better. Uh, but I, at night, I put lube in it, put lubrication in my eyes. And I know there's yeah. some dirty jokes going through some guy's head right now. <laughs> I mean, your fetishes are your <laughs> whatever. thing, Bobby, whatever. <laughs> We're not here to judge, you know, it's all good. <laughs> people do much weirder stuff <laughs> and um so wow like how you know so you have four kids how how were they through the process were they ever scared were they you know yeah how old, like, how old were they when this happened so you're talking from 15 8 9 10 in, the, in that age group mm -hmm. uh, the oldest daughter did amazing she at 15 got her license early so she could help the family out they gave it to her early she just did amazing things she actually became the first military child of the year um, wow. was, was amazing because everything she did, she took care of our family, her brother and sister, brought us dinner, helped them with homework, all while she's going to her fourth high school, <laughs> you know, between wow. moving around the military and me getting injured, she's now gone to four different high schools, still keeping her grades up. I get out of the hospital, she continues to help other veterans that are going in for surgeries. They're, you know, I was older, I was 35 when I got injured, 36 when I got in the hospital. These other guys are young, they have young children. 
She would stay the night at their house. They go, the, the wife would take them to have a surgery at five o'clock in the morning. My daughter would get their kids off to daycare and school, go to school herself. Oh my gosh. And just long period wow. of time like that and help. So that's why she won the first ever military child of the year. Uh, was it 2015? Uh, I can't remember the dates. I got blown. I've blown up moments. Uh, <laughs> but she won that and then and, and gone on. And now she actually, uh, there's, it's called the Fisher House Foundation. So every base has pretty much has a Fisher House on it. And at the Fisher House, uh, veterans are active duty military. If they're having surgeries, it's places for their family and then will stay while they're going through this process. And so she actually runs one of those in San Antonio now. Have you ever, you know, th- you know, met anybody, any veterans that have had like similar injuries to you? Oh, the there's the, <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. All the burns go to San Antonio, the Fort San Houston there at Brook Army Medical Center. So we all go there. All the burns go there. And so we see each other. We all mostly know each other. <laughs> um, one of the other most famous guys I get recognized as, because all Burt guys look alike, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> J.R. Martinez, he was on uh, All My Children, Dance with the Stars. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, he beat uh, Rob <laughs> Kardashian in 2011 on Dance with the Stars. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow, that's so, there's definitely a joke there, I'm sure, if you don't have one already, oh, I, yeah, I, about I've like all looking stuff. alike, I, yeah. I dressed up as J.R. for Halloween and made a mirror ball thing. Um, uh, I, I've, I've loved it. One time he tweeted out that someone asked him if he was the comic. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, what people do with like, uh, they meet a black person, they, they're like, oh, do you know? And then they name like five black people. Like, oh, do right. you know my friends? Like, are people like that with like, with Burns? Like, just like, hey, do you know? <laughs> right. Are like you guys you all friends? Five. I like how you throw up five. Like, it's a basketball team. I see what you're <laughs> <doing>. <laughs> that was accidental. I know nothing about sports. <laughs> wow. But yeah, we do. We, we do get, we, and the other Burn people, we know it. I mean, there's a, there's a cop. Jay, I forget his last name. His name is Jason. He got burnt in Phoenix. Uh, his squad car got hit, caught on fire. And so a lot of people, if I'm in, in, in Arizona, Vegas, a lot of people think I'm him. Oh, wow. And so one day I saw his picture. I'm like, oh, my God, he does look like me. I look like him. It was weird. <laughs> You're like, oh no, we just have the same plastic surgeon. <laughs> like, right. I mean, you just look like like all the Kardashians look alike, and they're they all have the same, you know, plastic exactly. surgery person. And the people always tell me how, you know, oh my God, you're 49. I have, I have a grandkids. I have three granddaughters. Wow. And we do that. I'm like, oh, you don't look like old enough. I said, I had all the plastic surgery. You know, it's <laughs> like oh, I've had a lot of work done. <laughs> a lot of work. It's just a million dollar face right here. <laughs> <laughs> I have an awesome sense of humor. Um do you so do you like you know go and visit hospitals or do you you know when's the last time are you looking to like maybe go out on another tour or you know like what's the farthest you'll travel yeah. now um this year everything's been canceled uh speaking engagements even had some in october they got pushed back the next year so <sighs> yeah it's all Ugh, down. yeah yeah it's just sitting here trying to write being lazy <laughs> uh, working on some stuff but it's just oh, it's hard to get motivated. It is writing. so <laughs> hard. The days blend together. You're like, I don't want to put on a fucking mask just to buy an iced coffee. You're like, but I have to get out of the house. Like, yes. you know, I just keep buying more plants. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I have a turtle. Well, I just keep buying more costumes to do TikTok videos <laughs> with. And <laughs> yeah. It's insane. You know, so how can I come up with something funny again? It's, but, you know, I hope to be out again next year when this is all done and could hit the road, want to do a lot more motivational speaking, get the nonprofit role again and helping other veterans. It's great to help the veteran suicide awareness and stuff and, and then maybe stop somebody from, from killing themselves. Do you, have you, ta- you know, yeah, have you talked to anybody who you was like in a really bad place? You know, like do people reach out to you that? All, all the time. Uh, that's, uh, <laughs> I've been blessed uh, with that. Uh, I, I guess the, having the courage and strength to do what I do, I, I feel I've been blessed to do that. Um, and I've been able to help other people by doing that and sharing that. And so many people will write to me on social media and send a message. Uh, either they'll tell me they went through this or that, they, they've lost a child, or I've had women telling me, you know, how they've been raped before and they have problems talking about it. But after seeing my story, that's helped them. They go to my page to look for encouragement. And that just means so much to me, uh, especially other veterans. I mean, I, I love everybody. I want everybody to still live. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. But when another veteran, says you really helped me through something because they can really relate to to me more on a personal note. Uh, that's huge. Uh, Gold Star families, they'll ask me how I've done something. I'll share, you know. Uh, I just had someone write me yesterday. I looked at it. Her brother was 
a fireman, but he got burnt in a car accident and he's still having a hard time going through some stuff. And she said, it looks like you live near me in North Carolina. And I was like, yeah, I, I do live in that area, but I'm in Kentucky right now for a month. <laughs> um, girlfriend works here, so I'm mm-hmm. stuck in Kentucky for a month. I got to be here. It's a beautiful place. I love Kentucky. How's right the now. fried chicken? I've always <laughs> wondered. <laughs> <laughs> Delicious. <laughs> uh, but it's, she asked told her, I said, you know, when I get back to North Carolina next month, uh, uh, I definitely was, let's have lunch. You know, I got Aww. some stuff in the beginning, but the middle of, I should be free. I put it in my calendar, but if I forget, bug me. <laughs> bug me. Yeah. Say, hey, look, you said you'd have lunch with me. Don't feel bad. Bug me. I need people to bug me sometimes. You get busy or you just forget. So yeah, I'll go, I want to go have lunch with them. If that can help this guy uh, through everything, then I want to be there. I want to help lend whatever experience I have to them. Um, I still own a miner a miner who got blown up in a mine, burnt or electrocuted somehow. In Florida, oh. reached out to me just before we all got isolated. <laughs> and so I was going to go down to Florida and visit them, but I wasn't able to. So I love that. When I'm touring around, I'm in town, and they got a burn unit, I'll go by and visit the burn unit and, and talk to patients. And even, even the doctors and the nurses, they, they need inspiration. That's a tough job. I just could imagine being a burn nurse, what they go through trying to fix us, the pain they know they got to cause us to heal us. Oh, it's gosh, really? Oh, so they actually have to, so like it gets, it hurts worse before it gets yeah, better. Yeah, I mean, they got to clean those wounds off. When you first get there, you got this, you go take a shower and no one wants to go to the shower. You know, it's, oh, okay. you get back in there scrubbing the, this bad skin off of you so they can put skin grafts on you and replace that stuff. You're, you're high risk for infections at that point. Um, so it's a really tough job, but they got to make you scream pretty much and to, to heal you. And wow. it's, it's, a, it's, it's a hard, hard job. I, I know the guy who helped me in ICU ended up helping me in up unit. He'd come visit me even when I got moved up and, and everything. And he'd come visit me and talk to me. And, and I still talk to him, you know, once in a while today in our busy lives. He's got children now, but it's so funny because every time I do see him, he's got to remind me of the time that he was trying to help me go to the bathroom. Hmm. <laughs> And he's trying to help me stand up because I couldn't pee sitting down, but I have stage fright, so I'm having trouble. It's <laughs> almost like you naked is burned into his mind. <laughs> he's holding the jug for me and trying to hold me standing up. And I whispered back to him, is, this is good for me, is it good for you? Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So even then, you know, just you yeah. know, even early on, I was trying to make some humor with it. That's amazing. If anybody is watching this and going through a hard time, you know, it's, it sounds like you are pretty accessible. Where can people, you know, reach out to you if they need a little yeah. boost? <clears throat> All right. I got a dry burnt throat. <laughs> <coughs> you can reach out to me at Bobby Inline on any of social media, <laughs> um, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, whatever you do. Um, I also have the, 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 the um, Forging Forward page, Bravo 748 any of those pages, I'll get your messages and uh, definitely see what I can do to help you. Okay. I love it. This is so great. Um, <laughs> but be patient right now because with everything happening, what is happening with that, that page right now? I'm getting flooded, <laughs> uh, you know, with my image being you. So I'm trying oh, to- Oh gosh. Yeah, that that's stuff. right. Yeah. It's so frustrating. It's like, you're, you're doing the right thing. You're trying to help other people. You're, you're saving lives. But it's so know. awesome. You know, I got yeah. the word out there just by the people that follow me. Like, please share this. Let's stop yeah. this so it doesn't happen to anybody else. Let's figure out how to fix this from happening again and let there be consequences. So thank everybody that followed me. Thank you so much for just putting this out there. Thank you for having me on today to get the message out there. Yeah, of course. And it's just, it's good that people, you know, must have made you feel really supported. People have your back. They, you know, it's, yes. and, and, you know, if it happens again, it's like, yeah, it just makes these, these, these outlets look really terrible. And it's like, I, I don't know, I feel like it's such bad taste. It's, you're lumping in people together. It's like, you, you don't know where everybody stands politically. And especially if it's like, they're on the opposite side of the agenda, you know, they're trying to push. It's like, yeah. It's even more gross. Um, Bobby, everyone uh, can follow you where on uh, your handle is just Bobby Henline. Bobby Henline. Yeah. Luckily, it's a rare name, so I don't have to have all that funny stuff. <laughs> B-O-B-B-Y-H-E-N-L-I-N-E. Um, Bobby, thank you so much for coming on the show. You're you're really an amazing, badass dude. I'm happy to know you. Let's definitely keep in touch. You know, come thank if you. you're ever in New York, you know, I'll get you hooked up with some shows. Um, yeah. Sounds awesome. like a plan. Remember, what's wrong with you? That's a motto. Are Not those your merch with... shirts? Yeah. What's wrong with What's wrong with you? You ever talk about it? It's for the foundation. 
Oh, wow. Okay. That's a great motto. Yeah. Instead of what's wrong with you, what's strong yeah, with you. What's wrong with you? Use your strength and build your weaknesses. I love it. Bobby, thank you so much for coming thank on. Thank you.